Hello everyone and welcome to Singularity One on One. Singularity One on One is a podcast feature of Singularity Weblog where you can go and listen to it or download it in full. As you may already know, my name is Nicola, aka Socrates, and as always, I will be the man with the questions. Today, I'm privileged to have Werner Vinge as my guest on the show. Known for his rigorous hard science approach, Werner Vinge first became an, an iconic figure both among cybernetic scientists and sci- science fiction fans with the publication of his 1981 novella True Names, widely considered to be the visionary work behind the Internet Revolution. Later, he gained even more public attention as a Hugo Award winner and the author who coined the term technological singularity in his science fiction novel Marooned in Real Time. So, without further ado, let me welcome uh, Professor Werner Vinge. Hi, Werner, and welcome to Singularity One on One. Hi, Nicola. Uh, just before we jump into the questions, I want to share with uh, Werner and our audience that I've been actually suffering uh, sick for the last two or three days, and as a result of that, my voice may sound uh, rather different than usually, so I hope my listeners uh, can bear with that. So anyway, uh, but I wouldn't want to miss uh, such a rare opportunity as to interview uh, Werner Vinge, um, and uh, that's why I still decided to go ahead with the interview. Anyway, uh, let's begin with the first question here. Werner, can you tell us a little more about yourself and your background, but especially why and how you got interested in issues such as science and advanced technologies in general, and writing science fiction in particular? Well, since a, a young child, I've always been uh, uh, I- interested in things associated with with uh, science. And uh, I remember that when I, I I was actually rather slow to learn to read. Um, my parents uh, told me that probably the first uh, book that I ever read all the way through uh, wasn't until the, the second grade or so, uh, but. That book was uh, Robert Heinlein's uh, uh, Between Planets. And one <laughs> thing that I noticed very early on was that it was very hard in the early 1950s to find stories where the world was different at the end of the story than it was at the beginning of the story. Um, you would occasionally find stories that seemed to be like that, but then at the end the character would wake up and it had all been a dream. Um, so the very rare stories that I could find in that era where the world was different at the end of the story than at the beginning of the story turned out to be pretty uniformly associated with the genre of science fiction. So basically, science fiction was with me there from just about the earliest that I was uh, uh, a- 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 able to um, uh, read and onwards. Um, the... the uh, idea of writing science fiction kind of grew along the way uh, and became a greater and greater part of that, although I, I did continue with the, with, the, with the science background in college and, and, and got my doctorate in mathematics. Well, that's very interesting, but if I may, let me ask you, how did it happen in that case then you didn't just try and become a science fiction writer from the very beginning, but you kind of ended up being a a professor of mathematics for about 30 years, as far as I know. Yes. And and only Um, towards the the latter part of your uh, sort of university or professorship career, uh, I think you sort of started shifting your attention towards uh, science fiction writing. Uh, Science fiction writing was always a hobby of mine. And uh, as I was uh, teaching full-time, that is, you know, academic year, um, uh, there really wasn't time to, to uh, uh, write very much science fiction. It was mainly during the summer vacations or during the Christmas breaks that I was able to write science fiction. So, uh, from, similarly in graduate school, uh, so from the end of high school until the year 2000, basically this was uh, sort of a, a, a hobby, a background thing, and as as hobbies go, I rather recommend it. By the way, since uh, there are many hobbies, well, most hobbies probably that can become quite expensive. <laughs> and in the case of writing, it doesn't have to be expensive at all, uh, except of your time. And 
and it has an upside. I mean, it's it's uh, quite possible that uh, um, what you do will will be successful and so- somewhat successful monetarily, but also from the standpoint of of uh, getting to see and uh, people and talk about things that you wouldn't have had a chance to otherwise. So I'm very very glad that I had the ac- the academic uh, career. Um, it, it certainly did dominate the, the, you know, the work during those 25 or 30 years. Um, I had the idea that when I retired from teaching that, that suddenly my writing output would go up correspondingly. And um, that's been one of the disappointments of the last 10 or 11 years is that my, my writing production has uh, pr- probably increased somewhat, but it, it, it hasn't increased by the factor of four that one might expect from just the, the numerical ratio of times. If I may say so, though, uh, quantity is not everything. The, the, the quality of your writing is outstanding, so I think you're making up there at the very Thank least. You. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you have a, a number of uh, very influential books. Um, I personally have read... Uh, three of yours, um, and, and uh, the, the latest one I read was uh, Rainbow's End. Yes. But, but I started with, with uh, the book where you coined the term, the technological singularity, um, and this is how I got introduced to your work in general. Uh, so perhaps it is best to start our, uh, the meat of our discussion here with uh, the Werner Vinge definition of what the technological singularity stands for. Because there's, you're the person who coined the term, and there's so many variations of it that I, I'd really like to, to get yours again here for the record. Right. My, when I use that term, technological, singular, technological singularity, uh, what I have in mind is the notion that in the uh, relatively near future, we can talk about that, um, uh, humankind will, using tech by using technology, uh, either create or become creatures of uh, superhuman intelligence. And there's various good reasons why techno- uh, singularity is is a good good metaphor in the, in that circumstance. Uh, but it 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 is it is a type of change, a technological change. Um, that is qualitatively different from the technological changes that we have achieved in in the past. Mm -hmm. And it's different in the following sense. Um, If um, uh, uh, Singularity one-on-one could, by some magical way, um, interview Mark Twain, (laughs) um, you could describe to Mark Twain um, what our era is like and what's going on in, in our era. And he would understand what you were saying. Uh, and I think actually Mark Twain would be quite enthusiastic about it because, uh, uh, you know, he really was a, a, a technophile. He was um, a techno geek, yeah. <laughs> yes. And you could, you could actually do the same exercise with, with people from even, even, fur, even further back. And yeah. you could describe our present situation to them as, as long as you had a common language. And it's very likely they wouldn't believe you, but they would understand what you were saying if mm-hmm. you, you, know, you could speak for an hour or two to them. Mm-hmm. Um, that's been the form of technology, technological, technological change up till now, that uh, changes were great, or that is large. They were generally unpredictable, uh, certainly unpredictable in detail and often unpredictable in, 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 in larger ways, but they could be explained um, to people from before the change. On the other hand, if you tried to do the same explanatory exercise with a goldfish, you, you probably would not be successful. If you tried to explain to a goldfish what was going on in our human world here today, you uh, would would not be able to do that. That is the difference uh, in terms of talking about and explaining things post singularity compared to now. It's not merely a matter of prediction. It's a it's a matter of the fundamental thing about observing the world has changed. And so, in that sense, 
the um, thinking of the term singularity as a metaphor. Um, it's actually a kind of interesting metaphor uh, by comparison with, um, uh, say, the, uh, the, uh, the singularity in physics that we get you know, near it with black holes. Mm-hmm. in which not very much information can be extracted uh, uh, about what's going on inside a black hole. That very, mind, very much reminds me to the, to the sort of a question metaphor of can a slug get Beethoven? Uh, and and, and yes. how, would, how would Beethoven sound to a slug, for example? I mean, <laughs> right? I mean, I'm sure that the slug in, in his own mind, or like, I, I don't remember the number of neurons that they had, something like 50 or something like that, they would sort of perceive the, the, the sound waves right. as some kind of vibrations, right? right. But, but <laughs> would that really amount to, to getting it, like? Right, oh, probably right. You not. Can't ta- right. You can't take a slug to the to the opera. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yes, indeed. So, so, okay, so so let me backtrack just a little bit here and see how that fits. Then, so, what is the motivation behind your work? Then, I mean, you started as a as a child enthusiast of science fiction. You you were a, a professor of mathematics for several decades, then you devoted yourself full-time to science fiction. You coined the term the technological singularity. What is this all leading towards? What's the motivation and what's the goal, if if there is any in the end? Um, The the personal goal, uh, in in a large sense, is is just getting some, uh, making some sense of the universe. Um, Plus, the, the wish for an optimistic view of the universe, because this, uh, although uh, thinking about things that might be smarter than us is 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 is, is, a, is a topic that you can get nervous about if you expect it to happen soon, uh, it is it is also overall an, an optimistic view of, of progress. So when I was growing up in the fifties, in the nineteen fifties, the um, notion of progress was was there. And in the science fiction magazines, there was um, a real effort to try to understand or see the limits of progress. And the more I read, and I think the, the, the more writers looked at this, the, um, the uh, wider the horizons uh, 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 seemed to grow. So in, in, by the late 1950s, in my personal evolution through this, um, I was looking for um, what sort of limits that there were on progress. And by that time, I have this great little book on my bookshelf, Automata Studies, edited by Claude Shannon and, um, uh, and John McCarthy. And uh, it, it, it really made an impression upon me at, at the time. And the first story that I ever, science fiction story that I ever wrote that sold um, was about intelligence amplification. And toward the end of it, uh, the cat is out of the bag in the sense that uh, it looks like intelligence amplification technology is, is going to go public. And a guy who was trying to stop it, stop that effort, made the comment that uh, he, he, this fellow was, a, was actually a general, a military general, mm-hmm. and he made the comment that um, uh, I, regard, I, I, I regard intelligence amplification as a, um, uh, a, a true revolution in, in, in weapons, um, but it also puts, puts the, the issue beyond um, uh, the control of mere humans. And so, in a sense... My position in this story, the general says, is that is 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 that of an anti-militarist. <laughs> uh, now, in fact, if 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 uh, intelligence amplification uh, were used for military uh, uh, goals, it certainly would be a, a military thing, and and in a way, a, a type of showstopper. On the other hand, um, the the military applications of uh, superintelligence is is really um, uh, if we can avoid the violence angle, uh, the, the military implications is really among the smallest impl- implications of of uh, superhuman intelligence for the mm-hmm. for the human race as a whole and for life in the universe as a whole. I will come back to to the military implications and and 
the sort of negative uh, potential scenarios of, of a singularity a bit later. But let me see how we can make sense of, or how I can make sense of, of what you just said in a single word. You you said that you've you've been a seeker, a, a person who tries to make sense of the universe. Um, if you are to put that in a single word, then would you say that you're um, a futurist, a singularitarian, a, a science fiction author, a, a professor and a teacher, a mathematician? Who is Werner Vinge in, in his own uh, words? Uh, I know people who uh, would rise in rage at the idea of trying to reduce uh, such to one word, uh, <laughs> since it, you know, it... it um, it's, it's a loaded like question. Saying, Tell me what this Encyclopedia Britannica says <laughs> in one word. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, there, are, there are certain basic notions of bit economy or bit, you know, data, data, lossy data compression. <laughs> uh, so having said that, and, you know, I wanted to frame that question in my, in my answer with those words. But, you know, if you, if you, if you, if you want one word, I, one thing, I, I, I would say the science fiction writer. Mm-hmm. Science fiction writer. Very interesting. So, uh, since you were the, the science fiction writer who coined the term, the technological singularity, and that was, I think, what, 30-some years ago in Marooned in real time. Um, Actually, let me, say, let me say a little bit, or modify that. Um, using the term, you know, singularity in the sense that I am using it, um, the first time I did that was at uh, an artificial intelligence conference uh, at Carnegie Mellon mm -hmm. in just a second. 93? In 1982. Oh, 1982, um, yeah. And, uh, and then Omni, uh, Omni Magazine, there was an, an editor from Omni. Uh, I was on a panel. Actually, it was a panel with Marvin Minsky, and, and this just popped out uh, when I was talking on the panel. And, af and afterwards... Um, one of the editors at Omni Magazine came around and asked me if I would be interested in writing an op-ed piece about that, which I did. And then, and then in the 80s, I wrote these two novels, um, uh, The Peace War and Marooned in Real Time. Mm -hmm. And the singularity uh, plays a background role, as you, as you mentioned, in, yep. um, in uh, Marooned in, in, in Real Time. This, all through the 80s, then, when I'd go to science fiction conventions, uh, you know, I'd talk about this, and people would talk to me about this, and, and, and after these books came out, more people would talk to me. And this gave me about 10 years to sort of, ref, uh, sort of think about the notion, and also since I was usually talking to technological people, mm -hmm. mostly programmers, but uh, there was really a lot of feedback and a lot of pointed questions. And so, in a way... It, it worked out ideally because in the early 90s, um, uh, I was invited to talk at, uh, uh, at NASA, and I gave a talk about the singularity. Mm -hmm. But by that time, I had gotten, I'd gotten my act together. I really uh, I had some nice examples. I, I had the, the sort of different paths to the singularity that we, we may talk about in this interview, but that are in, in, the, in, in my essay. And... Um, this meant that I, I took the talk that I gave and I made it into a printed essay, and it's on my. If, if you go to my uh, pages at San Diego State University, you can you can find that. But, uh, and that was in 1992 or 1993, and that's actually a very nice essay. And the and partly because I had 10 years to think about it, um, I think that essay stands up very well. In fact, if if I just get approached casually about this. I, I just point to that essay because there's virtually nothing in it that I would seriously disagree with at this point, and I said a lot of things right uh, mm -hmm. in, in, in there. So that's kind of my history of the way I'm using that term. It's a, it's a very classic essay indeed, and, and I only read it probably three or four years ago, and I was very impressed uh, about the fact that it still holds perfectly well in time, and, and it's perfectly reasonable still, even actually perhaps more powerful than, than in the 90s, because the awareness, the public awareness of, of the probability of, of the singularity as a very high potentiality is, is much higher, I think, than in the 90s. Right, now, I figure that as time goes forward, um, 
if, if you know if 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 some terrible disaster doesn't happen, I mean, yeah, if, yeah. If, if 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 our world continues, that this is just going to become until it happens, it's going to become kind of a a a part of the background wallpaper of modern culture. Is there is is this notion about what this progress means, and probably more and more as time goes on, it fits more with what appears to be going on. And as in, in that sense, it, it just becomes sort of a steady drumbeat, background music or background wallpaper to to how we look at things when it comes to progress. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think as time goes by, it's much harder to dismiss uh, than than it was ten or fifteen years ago. And I think in another five or ten years ago, it would be even harder to dismiss. So it gets to and be- even if a and even if a person, you know, even if it's not at the center of a particular person's notion of what's going to happen, yeah, um, it still is. It still is a way of looking at things. I think it's it's important when the person looks at the real world to have several. There are things you believe about the real world, but in trying to interpret what's happening from day to day, it's nice to have several different models, several different theories, uh, and. In, when it comes to the singularity, which is what I think in this regard I think about the most, um, I have these different ways of singularity, you know, different trends toward the singularity. And as I watch events in the real world, pigeonholing them with regard to that model is actually very useful. Now, I also run other models. Another model is singularity is not going to happen. <laughs> and uh, I actually gave a, a talk I'm quite proud of about that up at the Long Now a, a, a couple of years ago. Um, mm-hmm. and if you if you look for counter indicators uh, uh, things, there are ways of looking at, at the world that when you look at it with that particular set of glasses on, you see things that you might not have seen otherwise. So I think it's even if you don't believe all the theories that you encounter in, in the real world, it's good to have several of them that you think about carefully and use as filters occasionally to look at what's happening. And you you may things see things popping out of the background noise that you wouldn't have seen otherwise. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and in a way, that says to me that you were successful in your search, uh, because you did manage to find, it seems to me successfully, uh, a very powerful idea, which kind of really does make sense uh, from the overall uh, direction of things in, in the universe, I think. Would you say, mm, would you yeah, agree with yeah, that? Yeah, it's certainly been helpful to, help, helpful to me in the way I look at things my, myself. And I mean, the way it's, it's being picked up by a number of people, including myself, and, and now with uh, Ray Kurzweil's uh, mm-hmm. documentaries coming up in the mainstream and uh, him and Barry Ptolemy kind of having this big public relations tour across the TV networks, mm-hmm. radio stations, and so on, the idea comes more and more into the mainstream, I think. So a right, lot- it's, a real, yeah. it's, it's a little bit like imagining um, what it would be with the with the, what it was like in in recognizing the industrial revolution now i in my opinion the, the singularity is a much bigger thing than the than the than the industrial yeah, revolution but, but the industrial revolution as as we talk about it nowadays is spread over 150 years or so mm-hmm. and it would be interesting to kind of look as you progress through that time as a study, as an historical study to watch how commentators uh, the pace was much slower than it is now, but to watch how commentators, you know, woke up to the notion that something was happening and the sort of jargons that they applied to describe it. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, that same sort of realization, I think, is, hap- is, is, is happening here with computation and other, other things that have to do with thought. Absolutely. So, so let me, let me uh, see if we can push that concept even further. You said it took you about 10 years until you managed to get it polished and sort of well-formed into your mind and and you published your classic uh, 1993 paper. But have your concept evolved after that, from 1993 till 2011, for example? That's almost 20 years. Has anything changed for the last 20 (laughs) years? Ah, well, the answer to that is a little bit embarrassing because one of my... um, sort of uh, uh, in, in, uh, rules of thumb is that if you see somebody who hasn't changed their ideas for 20 years, there's something wrong. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, so I'm embarrassed because, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, um, there's very little that I would have to complain about uh, uh, with the with the NASA essay from '93. Mm-hmm. Um, so in terms of in terms of uh, things that um, or emphases that are different, I think I think really there are. And in fact, in the last two or three years, um, I've I, I, I have felt some changes. Uh, and it's it's really something that I that I would expect that as time goes forward, l- let's suppose the singularity really is going to happen. As time goes forward, you get a better idea of what's what's happening. And as I think Charles Strauss, the science fiction writer, has pointed out, uh, as you as you move along toward it, uh, if there is anything like added intelligence for the for the human race as a whole, which with the internet and with various you know, features that effectively amplify our intelligence, it's quite possible that we will, uh, as we move forward to it, uh, uh, actually have insights that were not possible uh, before. So that I do... Go ahead. That's very interesting here. Let me just jump right in because I'm also in in a sort of email exchange with Charles Stross for an interview. And yeah, be, be, because I love his book, Accelerando, and I think it's it's one of the best uh, singularity. Oh, which, which book? Accelerando. Which book? Yes. He's, actually, Charlie has written all sorts of super, super books, but that's certainly the... Uh, premier singularity one that he's written i think i i think so too but but the 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 most interesting thing was that in his email uh he told me something which quite surprised me and that was that he is more of a singularity skeptic for the last several years because he told me don't forget i wrote that book in 2004 (laughs) and and in the last several years i'm more of a singularity skeptic Ah, well, your interview with him should be very interesting. And I just can't wait to find out why. <laughs> but but that sort of also fits with your uh, interesting statement that people most no- normally should change their their ideas in time. <laughs> and thus, you you felt a little uncomfortable that you haven't changed your mind on the singularity too much. Right. I see. I I have sort of uh, uh, given that it's 2011. There's there's certain things that are going on that would would make certain of the trends that I that I had in the paper seem like they're going better and other ones went maybe going worse. So I, I do have the feeling that it's clear what is what it what is going on, but it's but it, it you know it's not a it's not a revolutionary change in the views that I had in, in the ni- early nineties. Let me let me grab this thought then and, and see what are the markers, what are the indicators that, that what you had in mind is, is actually occurring or unfolding as we speak, that we're getting indeed closer towards the singularity? And, and so, so do you see those? What are those? And if not, then what would be the, the negative markers that we're not getting to, towards a, a singularity? Right. Um, l- let me mention a background thing is that the IEEE spectrum uh, had a, a, an issue dedicated to singularity um, in 2008, and they had a lot of essays in it by, by pro and con points of view. Mm-hmm. And I highly recommend that. And 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 I and I, and I, I was I, I had the I had the uh, uh, enviable position of of, of getting to give it, giving to write a sort of summary where I was able to talk about everybody else's essay. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was a lot of fun for me, and I think, but I think it was a lot of fun for other people. And and one thing I pointed out there, in which I also I pointed out in the. Uh, 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 in the uh, 1993 essay, is these different paths to the singularity, and that those are the particular. I, I, I watch my symptoms about the singularity relative to each of those. So let me just say uh, roughly what those are. One is the classical artificial intelligence scenario. You know, you make a mm-hmm. machine that's very smart, um, which would include, if it's running a mobile, it would include robots. Um, then there is intelligence amplification uh, scenario that that we uh, use the computers to make ourselves, uh, as individuals, uh, superhumanly intelligent. Uh, and then there's the Internet scenario, which is humanity and its networks and, and the computers and their databases. All together, the ensemble is superhumanly intelligent. And then I think all, f- all four of those were in the 93 essay. But the next one that was in the 93 essay is an example of a ch- at least a change in emphasis. 
uh, I mentioned it in in just a single sentence in the in the in the ninety three essay, but and and I've come to regard it as quite important, and that is something I call the digital Gaia scenario, mm-hmm. and that is that the network of embedded microprocessors uh, becomes sufficiently powerful as to be considered a superhuman being, and that's going like gangbusters. I mean, that's just the whole the whole thing you see with. It, it, uh, uh, Individual devices are not especially smart, but when they are embedded in, in most of the physical technological artifacts of our world, mm-hmm. you get something that's, um, that is, 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 ex- is extraordinarily uh, uh, powerful. So That's like the swarm theory, isn't it? Uh, or the, the swarming, right? The individual ants are not very smart. Or yeah, the individual, individual ants are not very smart. The ensemble is, yeah. is uh, very, very smart. And in fact... You're familiar, I am sure, with the rapture of the nerds mm-hmm. characterization of okay yeah. of of the singularity. Um, it's my I next question, the, actually. So it's perfect. ah okay. Let me the uh, the the notion which I think most of your uh, listeners are also uh, you know familiar with is a very amusing criticism of the, uh, of of people who argue for the singularity is that it's 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 just. Um, of the religious of a religious apocalypse dressed up in technological garb <laughs> and and the phrase the singularity is the rapture is rapture for the geeks you know is a is a beautiful summary of that art of that uh, pointed argument and uh i i had an inter- i've had interesting encounters with uh you know journalists who make who, who make this point um but I think that the digital Gaia shows that when you talk about the singularity, you are talking about events, namely the rise of superhuman intelligence, that um, might might lead one to you know to to, to you know make religious sounding things, make you know uh, religious sounding comments. But uh, it's that's really a reflection more of its size and importance than it is a, than it is. A, a, a criticism, and in fact, the digital Gaia would probably not be at all like the apocalypse. It would, if you want to, you know, make analogies with existing uh, religions, the analogy would be with animism. Mm-hmm. You know that the that the the world wakes up and that uh, the objects in the world have have a spirit of the, of their own. In fact, n- another person to interview there would be Carl Schrader. Is that a fellow? S C H R O E D R. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's a Canadian science fiction writer who um, has has written some really cool uh, novels about a the notion of the of the the uh, uh, world itself waking up via uh, uh, fine grain distribution and also smart the notion dust that, and, yeah, so and so on. Say again. Smart dust. Uh, uh, smart smart dust is 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 one term for that, which is really just sort of a more extreme version of of just having lots of embedded uh, 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 processors. Yeah. Uh, and it wouldn't necessarily look like a swarm of killer ants coming at you. I mean, it's just the <laughs> the, 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 the the universe uh, reality becomes its own database, and uh, real and and. Uh, and reality wakes up, and it's certainly not uh, a thinking thing like uh, like you and I. If it has any analogy to human past and human philosophy, it, it would be to things like uh, uh, a- a- animism. Uh, and one other thing that that I think Schrader has brought up in his stories is that um, uh, if you look at it that way, you also have to sort of acknowledge that there that there could be types of mind that are unequivocally very, very, very powerful, um, but that they don't think at all like we do. And the uh, the I, I think the digital Gaia actually gives some hint of what that that sort of situation might might be like. In any case, if you look at the at the broad spectrum of the variety uh, of things that we can sort of imagine. Uh, it, it it definitely is a, a good indication that we're talking about something that is is not easily amenable to proje- to projection and prediction such as we've uh, talked mm-hmm. about in the past technologies. 
Let me let me go a little bit deep, deeper here on sort of the the negative benchmarks towards the singularity, <laughs> and precede that by mentioning that um, I recently watched a couple of videos with Jerome Lanier. Uh, yeah. who, who wrote a book uh, or a manifesto called You're Not a Gadget. And uh, I'm, I'm also um, scheduling an interview with him soon. But in those oh, two videos, he argues uh, very sort of determinately that, that the singularity is a pure form of a new religion. And he it's goes... A pure, excuse me, a pure form of what? A, a totally new religion. And he goes and he traces it back to, to sort of the the tragedy of Alan Turing and uh, his, you know, eventual suicide, uh, you know, being forced upon him after, you know, being treated with uh, right, right. Um, female hormones to cure, quote unquote, his homosexuality and, and how he wrote uh, uh, the Turing test in the last couple of years of his life and how from there on we sort of have this changed mythology, uh, you know, where it used to be Adam and Eve, but right now we replaced Eve with with a computer in the Turing test, and and uh, sort of it expresses the hidden desire of one overcoming one's sexuality, one's body, and one's death, and mm -hmm. and therefore the the sort of epitome of that idea culminates in the idea of the singularity, and it turns into a major religion. And he was going on why it it exhibits all the specific features of all the other religions, including intolerance, according to him. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure that uh, intolerance is the exact word that he used, but mm -hmm. in that sense that we are as sort of, um, in a way, close-minded um, mm -hmm. to alternative points of view as, as, you know, fundamentalists in other religions. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, let me ask you this first. Maybe you want to comment a little bit on that, but secondly, perhaps you can connect that with the negative benchmarkers or markers that could be showing that we're wrong, that that um, the singularity is not coming and, and in, indeed would be just an idea and mm -hmm. would remain so. Right. Well, first of all, I hope you do get uh, 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 to I I interview with Jerome. I, I, I think he really is uh, uh, one of the most articulate of the uh, he is. Uh, of, of the speakers. Mm -hmm. You know, contrary to the the, the uh, sorts of points that uh, uh, most singularity that singularity people make, um, when I look for negative things, um, and by negative I mean uh, symptoms that the singularity is not going to happen. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I, by the way, my my current situation is that I, I still figure that I'd be surprised if it doesn't happen by, by if it does not happen by 2030. Uh, or actually, I would modify that with assuming we don't get some big war or something. Mm -hmm. Science fiction writers have classically uh, avoided having to talk about the singularity by putting some fiscal disaster in the way, <laughs> slowing down technological progress. And, you know, if, if, if so, leaving that those such possibilities aside, um, I think the singularity is the most uh, likely scenario for the relatively uh, uh, near future. But uh, it's also possible that even in the absence of uh, a disaster, that it still would not uh, happen in you know within any sort of reasonable time. And that's what my talk uh, at Long Now uh, was about. So looking at that at that sort of restricted um, set of possibilities. As a science fiction writer and as a scenario writer, uh, one way of generating these uh, counter symptoms is to imagine that the year is 2050, and you're writing, and you've been commissioned to write an essay why it was obvious all along that the singularity would not happen. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, in, in in that case, you drop these these symptoms, and there there are things to to that you can watch for. Uh, and it seems to me that. Um, the most important thing to watch for is the possibility uh, uh, th that we just never figure out how to put the parts together. In other words, one of the strongest arguments for the singularity is this notion that um, uh, is Moore's law, mm -hmm. and the, and the notion that uh, that uh, human thought is ultimately substrate independent, mm -hmm. um, and, and and that we can do it on silicon, and we're making the silicon faster and faster, and eventually we'll 
if we can figure out how to put the parts together, eventually make something as smart as a human and then, in, in a sense, much more importantly, uh, something that's a lot, since we can already make people that are as smart as humans, that's already mm -hmm. doable, has been for thousands of years. <laughs> um, but uh, if we can do that on silicon, then it's pretty plausible we can do something smarter just by, if nothing else, turning up the clock rate. So one critical symptom or anti-symptom to watch for is um, failures to manage large software projects, um, fa failures to, to handle the levels of coordination that have to, have to go on in order to have uh, thinking things. And um, so one thing I actually do watch for is um, uh, progress and non-progress in software engineering. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in fact, the, it, all through the 80s, whenever I talked about this to programmers, they would make the point that, you know, this talk about Moore's Law is fine, but uh, um, uh, the Moore's Law for software engineering, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the growth rate for the effectiveness of software engineering is nothing like the, uh, like the, um, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the hardware rate. In fact, uh, I, I'm not sure anybody has written it up, but there is the, oh, I wrote, yeah, I did write it up in my, I think my talk at Long Now, is you could imagine, uh, and I say this only, I only say this only facetiously, a sort of uh, Mur Murphy's, um, Murphy, Murphy's uh, law has a corollary to address Moore's law. Uh, <laughs> And the, and, the, and the corollary is that uh, the software is so hard to do that uh, um, the ability to use the hardware only grows as the log of the hardware power. Yeah. So that, so that means that basically every Moore's Law generation, you know, you get just the, the increment uh, uh, of uh, the log of the improvement of the, of the hardware. So basically you just sort of lumber along in a, in a linear way. And if one looks at what you can do with a two gigahertz, one gigabyte RAM uh, processor in our era and compare that what you, with what you could do with a 1980, um, uh, 8086. Uh, it certainly doesn't seem like a, like a million times improvement mm -hmm. in many, in, in many non-numerical sorts of uh, ways. So uh, I have a, a long list uh, of um, uh, Terrible software disasters that could turn people away from you know the the, the money here the, the money that is driving the progress. Basically, um, one of the fundamental things about the, why the computer stuff has been going so well for so long is that unlike a better mousetrap, which only which only attracts funding from one source, the people who have too many mice, mm -hmm. um, the computer business is something that has. 360 degrees of, of demand. Almost anything that humans are doing, and certainly anything of an economic nature, mm -hmm. um, can be improved by computers. Yeah, big time. Yeah. by every improvement in computation, yeah. and this means that unlike and the and, and the payoff is incremental. Mm -hmm. Like I'm still a, a super big fan of spa of space flight stuff, but. The space flight has not been get, been able to give us uh, a a the sort of revenue payoff per small incremental investment mm -hmm. that that the computer stuff has. So you have that combination of of kind of universal um, um, profitability plus incremental profitability, and that is the thing that has just driven this so hard. So if you could break that. If you could imagine something that would break that combination, and one possibility would be if you begin to get either very large software disasters or the um, black hat angle on the internet got to be so bad, uh, you know, we're, what we're, what is the spam level of internet traffic right now? I think eighty percent or something. I've heard these. Yeah, I've heard numbers like eighty yeah. percent, and uh, it is just a tribute. To the uh, to the uh, awesome progress that we're we're doing, that that's survivable. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it is very. In fact, it's been very well survivable. We're, we're, you know, we're, the, the internet is still a very is is a growing and and uh, a thing that can still justify all sorts of hype. I think, in fact, the era of of hype for my whole point, I guess, is that the era of of hype for um, 
uh, computation and automation and networking is is um, uh, is uh, is ongoing and is and is and is well justified. But negative symptom would be you begin to see disasters that are fa- failures of integration that are large enough so that uh, there is not a payoff to, to, to you know setting up the next uh, the next large progress. And if that happened, then you get a ripple back into the economic drivers behind uh, the technological uh, improvements. So you could imagine a sort of leveling off. In fact, I've written stories where it does level off. And if you think along those lines, probably the last thing to level off would be um, very simple improvements in in, um, semiconductor integration. So probably the last thing to level off would be improvements in memory size. Mm -hmm. So I had this vision, which actually executed in... in, uh, deepness in the sky, where eventually you could get a laptop that would have all the software that had ever been written <laughs> on it. And it could run it all via, via emulators at one speed or another. So then if you come across a project that you have to do, this is like 10,000 years of legacy software then. Mm-hmm. If you come across a project that you have to do uh, that involves software, you have a choice that actually we have right now, but it would be much more intense. That is, do you go laptop diving? <laughs> or do you try to write new code? And the thing is, what you're trying to do would almost certainly be in there, and it would be done as well as anything you could think of. Um, but in order to in, in order to uh, you know interface it with whatever your current situation is, would be an amount of work that might be as large as writing the thing um, anew. Mm-hmm. Werner, we have about. 10, or minute, 10, 15 minutes or so left from our interview, and I'm going to try to squeeze in the other three or four questions that I have for you. Um, so let me let me see if I can wrap this part of our discussion up with, with the question about uh, your estimate about our chances of surviving the singularity. I mean, Ray Kurzweil is often criticized for being too optimistic, and I myself here get surprised quite often by people I interview uh, who give me surprisingly low estimates. Um, for example, Michael Onisimo from the Singularity Institute uh, gave me 25%. Uh, George Dvorsky, uh, who is a Canadian transhumanist, um, gave us less than 2%. Um, what, in your opinion, is the estimate that we would survive the if the singularity, if the singularity yeah. happens, yeah, uh, I think singularity is certainly the the most likely non-catastrophic thing that could happen to us. Uh, I think the chances of uh, our uh, survival is, or the survival of human. First of all, the human race. If you look at other species, the idea that it would still be around as it is now, a million years from now, or ten million years from now, you know, by by past standards of of um, paleontology, that's very unlikely. <laughs> so if that's, if that's what a person means about the human race surviving, then I, th- I think the human race uh, is going to gr- grow into something better. Uh, so, is the question, it, 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 so the question comes down to, is one talking about that something better that we become? Yeah. Or is it, okay, the alternative to talk about... You know, My presumption is that if we survive, we would have to change fundamentally, right? But there still would be continuity right. between right. what we are right. and what we would have yeah. become. And I think that's very high probability. And in, in, in fact, spin this discussion back to 1930. Mm-hmm. In, in 1930, uh, there would be people who would talk about, you know, sometime 100,000 years from now, uh, we humans, the, the culmination of, of all our dreams of social progress and intellectual progress and technological progress. Maybe a million years from now, we'll become something better. And everybody would get a nice, warm feeling about that. You know, very few people would be upset by that. It, it, it's the prospect that it might happen before you retire uh, that uh, makes people get all nervous. Mm-hmm. So, uh, viewed in that context, I think it's very unlikely that, the, assuming the singularity happens, it's very unlikely that uh, it, you know that it would be uh, it would make the human race extinct. Um, the if you're talking about Homo sapiens 1.0, yeah, 
2.0 maybe after the, yeah, the singular. But yeah, if we, let's talk about let's talk about the survival of of Homo sapiens 1.0. Mm -hmm. In other words, the standard, yeah. unaugmented. I think I think there would still be actually a significant uh, um, uh, place for for such as you and me are now. Um, now, and, and and the general reason is um, uh, a, a matter of uh, of safety. Mm -hmm. um, look at it this way: If you're a superhuman intelligence, you know, with a, with a big um, silicon component or whatever, you know, non-biological component, uh, you have to consider the possibility of existential threats yourself. And and one thing to realize about the universe is, um, Mother Nature can be pretty brutal. <laughs> there, are, we live in a universe that has disasters at all scales. Yeah. Uh, and if 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 you were such a, um, a a super mind, you'd have to consider the possibility that some dark and rainy night, some disaster might come along and wipe you and all your silicon assisted or silicon constructed um, brethren out of existence. Now, think about that situation. What are the chances that if there are no people like uh, uh, Werner and Nicola 1.0. If there are no people, no people like normal humans around, bio, you know, living in a biological situation, what are the chances that machines would ever arise spontaneously? Zero. Yeah. Very near to zero, probably. I, I think. Yeah. On the other hand, what are the chances that humans say, even without technology, if they if they were still around, even without technology, but with their own biological infrastructure, you know, the natural world, uh, with, uh, with green stuff in it, um, what are the chances that we would make the machine skin? I'll tell you, actually, the chances are near one, yeah. if it can be done. Um, and that's not necessarily because we love machines so much. It's just that we can't help ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. We go out and tinker and we make things. And, and eventually, in a very short geological period of time, um, the big brains would be back in business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so let me ask you then, since we've mentioned Werner and Nicola 1.0 and 2.0, let me ask you <laughs> this very personal question. Now, you have been, philosophically speaking, at the cutting edge of technology and science fiction, uh, yet we are talking over an old-fashioned landline, and in your own email to me, uh, you sort of self-admitted that you're very, <laughs> quote, I am very low tech here. Right. So how do you square this? How do you explain this? Isn't that sort of paradoxical that Werner Vinge, the person who coined the term the technological singularity, is self-admittedly very low tech and doesn't use Skype even and and so on? <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, that, that's, that is a... a, a uh, uh, as we're running out of time here, that, that actually is a very a fairly large topic. One is one part of it is that uh, that we didn't touch on it in this talk in this uh, interview is uh, uh, I have I have lots of misgivings about uh, I, I'm 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 I really have not participated in the social networking stuff the. The, despite the book Rainbow's End, um, that's an, that is one angle of participation in technology that I have not uh, done. Mm -hmm. And part of it is that I just don't have the attention time to do it. Mm -hmm. um, part of it is that this we are, I, I think, a, tr a trend that is bad um, is that if you, if you get a big positive feedback from doing something, and if the risks of doing it, uh, and I'm not talking about singularity risks here at this time, but the, the, the risks of doing it are unquantified, it's very easy to convince yourself um, to do more and more of this behavior that's rewarding. And the, the whole thing with um, uh, losing privacy and... and, 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 uh, uh, and uh, and 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 financial privacy, and th this this I think is the the risks uh, are underestimated, mm -hmm. and that uh, 
one thing that they find, that has been found, I think, with uh, simple embezzlement, is that automation actually makes embezzlement much rarer. But the ticket price of each event becomes much larger. Mm-hmm. In, in other words, uh, once the damage you ship, is greater. Right. I think that that the great danger, and it's especially epitomized by the digital Gaia scenario, mm-hmm. is that it transforms the universe into something where anything can happen. In other words, what would it be like if the physical universe were as unpredictable as financial market? Mm-hmm. So in, in interviewing uh, 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 Taleb, the guy who wrote The, the Black Swan, mm-hmm. would, be, would be something I think you'd find very interesting. I don't know whether that's a book that you have uh, looked I've at. I've heard about the book. Yeah, it's very, actually a very important book. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, um, if, if the world got transformed into a place, and it is being trans- it, this is happening, where basically exponent overflow can happen about real world issues. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not just for inside your computer. It's also for things having to do with everyday life. That actually is, makes a person very uneasy. And I have all sorts of concerns about, you know, how that is being put into place. Mm-hmm. And you know, in a way, I, what I think and hope will happen is that we'll get uh, the, the, the frictional, that is the bad things that could happen, uh, will happen at a rate that they can be addressed. Mm-hmm. And so in a way, what we're going through is 50 million years, the equivalent of 50 or 400 million years of biological evolution. We're going through it in a matter of 40 or 50 years. Mm-hmm. And you really have to be on your toes. And basically, I'm cautious enough that I'm not uh, one of the first uh, adopters. But aren't you scared you're going to get left behind? Ah, a real possibility. <laughs> Because that's the, the 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 upside is you yes you get to keep your privacy and your safety in in that sense but the downside is that you wouldn't be riding the wave. Right, and I and I've I've often wondered, for instance, it's 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 almost a it's almost a cliche that young people are are totally all um, cavalier mm-hmm. about their their own privacy. Absolutely, and. I, I, and to me, that means one of two things: either it, either they're not clear on the principle, <laughs> no, they're making a serious mistake. Either that's one, or they realize that in ten or fifteen years they'll be running the show, mm-hmm. uh, and um, society is going to change. Mm-hmm. So there's another set of interviews, like with David Brin and the Transparent Society type stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, you, you could imagine a different society where these things are just taken in a different way. And the fact that there's some real strange clip of you on YouTube somewhere, you know, when you're 17, Mm -hmm. 18, that that really just doesn't count. Mm -hmm. Let's bring our uh, interview here to a close with uh, the second last question, which is, I know you were writing a book um, last time when we were exchanging emails. Perhaps you'll be willing to share a little bit uh, about your latest project with us? And we will uh, yes. be able to, to get it off the shelves. I am just uh, as we speak. Yes, as we speak, I am finishing up correcting the second pass page proofs to my novel, um, The Children of the Sky, which actually is now visible for pre-order on um, Amazon. And this is a this is a sequel to my novel, um, A Fire Upon the Deep, mm-hmm. and it takes place about about ten years later. It takes place in, uh, essentially all entirely on the Tynes world, which is where most of the Fire Upon the Deep took place. Mm-hmm. And you said it's available to pre-order on Amazon, but when do you expect it would ship? Oh, oh, yeah, the publication date is some date, some date in October 2011, so this year. Mm-hmm. Great. I'm looking forward to, to get my hands on it and, and ah, read it. Great. Excellent. All right, so uh, usually I have the habit of uh, closing my interview with the last question, which is, uh, if you have one single message to our listeners today, what would you like it to be? Um, I I think uh, an exhortation uh, uh, to optimism and uh, intelligent involvement in in what's going on. Mm Mm-hmm. Would you like to elaborate on that a little bit in the cup? Uh, 
No, chief, chiefly because then we would go on for some time more. But, <laughs> but basically, there's there are all sorts of terrible things that can happen. And, you know, the future cannot be predicted. There's all sorts of terrible things that can happen. In my opinion, the most the most likely of those terrible things are are very mundane, like war. Mm-hmm. Um, that that the things that that we are that we are uh, been concerned about for most part in this in this interview have enormous upsides. They 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 do they are worth the attention of people who have any intellectual uh, interests at at all. And there's probably some varieties of them um, that um, uh, that are of concern. But that that o- overall we are in a situation where uh, we can surpass the wildest dreams of optimism of previous generations. And in fact, that's the chief source of the nervous making, I think. If you really start thinking that you can get everything that's ever been dreamed of, then you have to start looking at what those dreams were. Because if you come down to implementing some of them, you're confronted with definitions that you finally have to, have to get clear about. Mm-hmm. So we can surpass the wildest dreams of optimism. I like that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I am very happy every time I see, you know, every, every time I see all the, the, the wonderful things that are happening in this, in this area. Fantastic. Well, on this note, then I would like to thank Werner Vinge for taking over an hour of his time today to be with us. Thank you very much, Okay, Werner. thanks, Nicola.